The year after starting Arizona, and with World War I now underway, in 1915, the U.S. began its next class of battleship, the 32,000-ton New Mexico class. Originally, only a pair were to be built, after the Navy only started one ship each of the two previous years. Prior to that, two ships had been started per year, and the Navy was eager to catch up. So, a third was paid for by selling two small, slow, and short-range pre-dreadnoughts, the previous Mississippi and Idaho, to Greece. As built, these ships were an incremental improvement on the previous Pennsylvanias. The most obvious change was the adoption of an angled, or raked, or clipper bow. This helped keep the forward part of the deck dry. This in addition to still having a raised forecastle deck. Also, to help keep out spray, the hull-mounted casemates of previous classes was omitted. Unfortunately, the decision to do so was made as the ships were nearing completion. As a result, Mississippi, the first to be finished, actually completed with them while the other two still had the characteristic knuckle in the hull. This was to be the first of many differences between the three ships as they evolved. Main armament was also improved. While their 12 14-inch guns still retained the 15-degree maximum elevation and used the same shells as previous classes, these were new 50 caliber guns rather than the previous 45. The new mountings that housed them allowed the barrels to be individually sleeved meaning they could raise and lower separately of each other in the turret. As such, it would be more accurate to call them three-gun turrets rather than triple turrets. The most radical change, though, was in the engine room of New Mexico herself. Turbines had finally definitively replaced reciprocating engines in the previous class, but the Navy suspected it could do even better. Turbo generator electric drive steam turbine direct drive was the norm for the time. For the sake of simplicity, let's not worry about generating electrical power for the ship yet. In this type of propulsion, boilers burn fuel to heat water which then turns to steam. The steam then turns the blades of the turbines like a windmill before recondensing and heading back to the boilers as feed water to start the process all over. The higher the pressure, the faster the turbines turn. The faster the turbines turn, the more power they produce. The trade-off is it requires burning more fuel to produce more steam to gain the higher pressure to turn the turbines faster. The turning turbines then drive the propeller shafts through reduction gearing, which reduces the several thousand RPM of the turbines to something usable by the propellers. Turboelectric drive works the same way until you get to the turbines running the propeller shafts. Turboelectric drive worked more like submerged submarines. Rather than driving the propellers directly, the turbines simply generated electricity which then powered separate motors which churned the propellers. In practice, this offered several advantages. 1. While fitted with turboelectric drive, New Mexico was about 20% more fuel efficient than her sisters she achieved the same speed on less horsepower. 2. Being made up of smaller parts meant subdivision was greatly increased, thereby containing flooding. This was the key selling point. 3. Smaller parts also meant they were easier to work on while underway. 4. Because the turbines weren't connected to the propeller shafts, they could be fitted in tandem rather than side by side. This freed up lateral room, which could be devoted to a better TDS, which, in the next class, they were. 5. Also, because the turbines didn't directly drive the shafts, power distribution redundancy was simplified. If a turbine or its generator went offline, whether it be due to mechanical breakdown, battle damage, or just for maintenance, the associated shaft didn't go with it. The other turbine generators could be simply crossed over to keep the propeller running. In theory, a turboelectric drive ship with four turbines and four propellers could keep driving all four propellers equally even if three of the four turbines were out. 6. Another advantage was reverse. 
In a typical direct drive layout, putting a ship in reverse required changing over to a reverse gear attached to a reverse turbine. This meant the ship had to stop, switch gears to the reverse turbine, then go. Kind of like a car. In turboelectric drive, because the propellers were driven by an electric motor, changing into reverse simply meant flipping a switch that reversed the current flow which drove the motor the other way, much like a ceiling fan. Moreover, because each propeller had its own motor, they could switch directions separately. This meant the propellers on one side could be run forward, while the ones on the other side could be run backward. In theory, but a disappointingly few times in practice, this meant a turboelectric ship could achieve a near zero turning radius to outmaneuver incoming torpedoes, shells, and bombs. 7. Due to how it worked, turboelectric ships could offer much more electrical power to the ship. While this wasn't a big deal in 1915, in World War II, this became very important. Up to and during World War II, electrical usage spiraled. Radar, mechanical computers, remote power control for guns, radios, air conditioning, ovens, and many others consumed more and more electricity as the war went on. New Mexico was started October 14, 1915 and finished May 20, 1918. Mississippi was started April 5, 1915 and finished December 18, 1917. Idaho was started January 20, 1916 and finished March 24, 1919. Main armament was 12 14-inch 50 caliber guns in four triple turrets, two forward and two aft, all on the center line. Like all triple turrets, they used a downward swinging breech block to save space. Like previous battleships, maximum elevation was originally 15 degrees. By World War II, however, this had been increased to 30 degrees, increasing their maximum range from 12 miles to 18 and a quarter miles. The actual projectiles they fired were the same as in previous 14-inch gun battleships. Like those ships during World War II, in light of their primary function being fire support, usually three-quarters of their magazine loadout was high-capacity rounds with the rest being armor-piercing. Again, 100 rounds per gun were usually carried. Rate of fire was up to four rounds per minute per gun, with a more realistic rate being two rounds per minute. After prolonged firing, forcing gunners to go deeper and deeper into the magazine, even as they got more worn out, this could drop to one round per minute, or even one round every two minutes. As with most heavy guns, powder was in four bags. Secondary armament was the standard 5-inch 51 caliber gun. Mississippi was completed with the original design of 22 of these guns four on each side in hull-mounted casemates, one under the barrels of turret one, one under turret one proper, one under the barrels of turret four, one near the rear of the ship. Again, while having the frames for these guns, New Mexico and Idaho were never fitted with them. All three ships did receive the other 14 guns, five on each side in casemates built into the superstructure just above the main deck. Above the casemated guns on each side were the two open mount guns, one just behind turret two and one near the end of the forecastle deck. Turretary armament was four three-inch 50 caliber anti-aircraft guns. Finally, two 21-inch torpedo tubes were fitted. Power was provided by nine boilers venting to one funnel. In New Mexico, these powered two turbine, or turbo, generators. These powered four motors, one on each shaft, which developed 27,000 horsepower for a top speed of 21 knots. In Mississippi and Idaho, they powered four turbines that generated 32,000 horsepower to directly drive the four shafts, again to a top speed of 21 knots. Armor was along the same lines as the previous classes. 
The main belt stretched from turret 1 to turret 4 and was 13 and a half inches near the top, thinning to 8 inches below the waterline as it neared the bottom. Deck armor was 3 and a half inches from turret 1 to turret 4, again with a 6 and a quarter extension over the steering gear. 13 inch bulkheads closed off the ends of the armored box. Barbette armor was 13 inches. Turret armor was 18 inches on the front and 5 inches on the sides and roof. Conning tower armor was 16 inches. Below the water, they were double hauled except midship where they were triple hauled as part of the TDS. All three were heavily modified. Shortly after completion, Mississippi had her hull mounted casemate guns removed. All three were fitted with flying off platforms on turrets 2 and 3. These didn't last long though and were quickly replaced with a pneumatic catapult at the stern. In 1922, the two rear open mount 5 inch 51 caliber guns were removed and four more 3 inch 50 caliber anti aircraft guns were added, bringing the total up to four on each side. Between 1931 and 1934, all three received their major modernization. All were reboilered, with New Mexico receiving four boilers, while the others got six. All three received new geared turbines. In New Mexico's case, this meant removing the turboelectric drive. It's not that the turboelectric drive had been a failure, quite the opposite actually. That being said, because of how many more parts it entailed, turboelectric was more expensive per unit. Also, it was cheaper to order three sets of geared turbines than two sets of geared turbines and one set of turboelectric machinery. The economy of scale. Remember, this is the early 30s and the depression was hitting hard. There was an even more important reason though. The treaties. Under the treaties, Maximum weight was limited, so every weight saving that could be made had to be. With its many heavy pieces parts, the advantages of turboelectric couldn't justify its weight. The conversion to direct drive was actually pretty easy. Originally, her engine spaces had been made for direct drive, then had the turboelectric motors installed. So, really she was converted back to direct drive instead of to it. Kind of. This new machinery allowed them to maintain 21 knots despite their increased weight and width. Armament was also improved. A new version of the 14 inch 50 caliber gun was installed and elevation was increased to 30 degrees. Already lacking hull mounted casemates, there was no need to alter her 5 inch 51 caliber secondary armament. The 8 3 inch 50 caliber anti-aircraft guns were replaced with eight of the new 5 inch 25 caliber anti aircraft guns, four on each side midship. The torpedo tubes were also removed. Again, they weren't just useless, they were actually a liability since they compromised subdivision. Deck armor was increased to five and a half inches. Underwater, larger bulges were fitted in light of the growing sizes of torpedoes and to regain lost buoyancy. Like the other four gun battleships, a gunpowder catapult was added to turret 3 while the old one at the stern was replaced with a newer model. The most obvious change though was the construction of a new tower superstructure with a raised funnel, unlike the tripods of previous modernizations. Weight rose to 33,420 tons, but since the following classes weren't seriously modernized until after Pearl Harbor they were considered the best battleships in the fleet at the start of World War II. In 1941, the remaining open mount 5-inch 51 caliber guns were removed in preparation of fitting more medium anti-aircraft, but 3-inch 50 caliber guns were fitted in lieu due to availability issues. In mid-1942, the catapult on turret 3 was removed to make room for more anti-aircraft guns. In the fourth quarter of 1942, all three went to the west coast for overhaul. Unlike the Pearl Harbor veterans who got rebuilds, 
these ships only received comparatively light upgrades. New Mexico and Mississippi traded their two rearmost casemated 5-inch guns on each side for more light and medium anti-aircraft along with improved radar and fire control. Idaho traded all of her casemated guns for more light and medium anti-aircraft along with improved radar and fire control. During a refit lasting from October 1944 to January 1945, Idaho traded her eight 5-inch 25 caliber guns for 10 5-inch 38 caliber dual purpose guns in single turrets, five on each side. While repairing damage in March and April 1945, at the insistence of her captain, Mississippi replaced her remaining casemated guns for more 5-inch 25 caliber anti-aircraft guns. This brought her up to 16 5-inch 25 caliber guns, eight on each side, two at the main deck level with the other six on the superstructure. All three were in the Atlantic on December 7, 1941, having already covered the occupation of Iceland. Following Pearl Harbor, they sailed to the Pacific to reinforce the fleet. Most of 1942 was spent defending the West Coast and Hawaii with the occasional escorting of convoys. Following overhaul at the West Coast, all three headed to the Aleutians, where Idaho covered the recapture of Atu and then joined her sisters in supporting the recapture of Kiska in mid-1943. All three then ended the year supporting the invasion of the Gilberts, where on November 20th, Mississippi suffered a magazine explosion which sent her back for repairs. In January and February of 1944, all three supported the invasion of the Marshalls, followed by New Ireland in March. In the second quarter of 1944, New Mexico and Idaho covered the liberation of the Marianas while Mississippi went in for refit. In the third quarter of 1944, New Mexico joined Mississippi in refit, leaving only Idaho of this class to cover the recapture of Peleliu and the other islands south of the Philippines. In the fall of 1944, Idaho went in for refit and Mississippi returned to cover the liberation of Leyte, where, at the Battle of Surigao Strait, she fired just once. New Mexico returned from refit near the end of 1944 and joined Mississippi to cover the liberation of Luzon in the northern Philippines and face the empire's most dangerous weapon, the kamikaze. On January 6, 1945, a kamikaze hit New Mexico's bridge, killing her captain. Another hit Mississippi near the waterline, sending both ships back for repairs and leaving only the returning Idaho to cover the Iwo Jima invasion. All three supported the invasion of Okinawa, rested, repaired, and rearmed. They would need it. Off Okinawa, on April 12, 1945, Idaho was near missed by a kamikaze that acted like a torpedo hit. On May 12th, New Mexico was hit by a kamikaze. On June 5th, Mississippi was hit. All three were repaired but the war ended before the start of Operation Downfall, the invasion of Japan. Post-war, New Mexico and Idaho were sold for scrap, while Mississippi replaced Wyoming as a training ship, becoming the only battleship ever fitted with surface-to-air missiles. She was finally scrapped in 1956.